Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Connections. My name is Shawnee Turner. I'm the Interpretive Learning Director at the CAC. And today we are joined by Noel W. Anderson. Thanks, Noel. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Oh, I appreciate you, too. Um, I want to give you a little little intro bio, if that's good. Ooh. Cool, 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 All cool, right. cool. So Noel W. Anderson is an interdisciplinary artist based in Harlem and works primarily with printmaking and French weaving. He received an MFA from Indiana University in printmaking and an MFA from Yale University in sculpture. He is also area head of printmaking in New York University's Steinhardt Department of Art and Art Professions. He is currently an artist in residence at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. Noel has been awarded the NYFA Artist Fellowship Grant the prestigious Jerome Camargo Prize, and the paper-making residency at Dieu Donné. His solo monographic exhibition, Black Origin Moment, debuted at the Contemporary Art Center in February 2017 and traveled to the Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga in October of 2019. His upcoming solo show, Heavy as the Crown, opens at the Telfair Museum in Savannah in the fall of 2021. His work is included in the permanent collections of the International Center of Photography, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Hunter Museum of Art. So one, I just want to say uh, thank you for joining me today because I know you are busily getting ready for a new semester, which I'm sure will bring a lot of challenges to you. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> something like that. Um, I'm going to share the screen in a second and just show some images from the exhibition, but I wanted to turn it over to you to talk about how Black Origin Moment came about at the CAC. Oh, well, you know, I used to be a, an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati uh, in print, and my studio was on the west side of the city, and the curator at the time, uh, Stephen Madoff? Maticio. Stephen Maticio. Stephen Madoff was uh, at uh, SVA. Steven Matizio, Matizio, sorry, uh, came to my studio and wanted to do this show. And I was like, cool. I had to have this, I, I, I needed a title and an idea and I realized that my work basically deals with black archives. So it just, it just came from there, you know. Uh, it all, I, think, I, I think I can say it also came from some of my interest in um, and what it means to have an archive, hmm. which I think we could talk about if you want to talk about that later, but yeah. It, it came yeah. from my interest in what it really means to have or what an archive is, you know. Um, and once once I realized that that was like the premise, specifically the question, uh, when did I first know I was black, which sparked all of this, it just opened me up because I started to realize that there were moments in which um, black people are initiated into blackness, right? Whether it's from the mother's womb or whether it's, you know, on the way to the tomb, if we think about what's happening in Wisconsin. There are consistent moments in which we are always, always already uh, being informed one way or the other that we are of color and we are black. So it started there. Ooh, um, let, me, let me go ahead and uh, break into that question about the archive. What is the importance of the archive for you? I know you mentioned um, in an interview somewhere that I read um, that you really like to collect things. Um, oh, yeah. how, did this, how did this get started and how did it grow to the importance where you wanted to build an exhibition around it? Well, I, you know what? I'm, I'm a collector of images. I've got tons and tons of books everywhere, stacks and stacks and stacks on racks. And, um, I, have, I, I mean, I tell this story all the time. I know people heard it when I was doing the uh, talk of the CAC as well as at uh, Hunter uh, last year that, you know, sometimes I can't sleep and I stay up at all hours of the night. Um, sometimes I stay up for days and, you know, put someone in a kind of delirium if you haven't been sleeping. And I tend to buy books and images offline in bulk. And, you know, I think as an undergraduate, I was very much influenced by uh, Gerhard Richter's archive. Mm -hmm. Right. And I realized, well, I'm just, I could just do the same thing. And I'm just massively or consistently collecting materials from, from everything. And sometimes it's not images. Sometimes it's sounds. It's all ephemera. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a photograph of a stain I see on the sidewalk. Right. I think artists are I think I think artists are consistently developing their own archives, whether they realize it or not. My interest in my archive is that it intersects what we assume are um, 
conventional or institutional archives, right? So um, New York Times, um, when I was a boy, it might've been the Encyclopedia Britannica, because mm-hmm. we had the, the full set, leather set from like 1952, but we still had it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I had one of those too. <laughs> right? It had that smell, like that smell when yeah. you open the book, that's a part of the archive. Yes. Right? My, my understanding of it is open. My mm-hmm. understanding of what an archive is infinite, right? I mean, this computer is a part of the archive, right? If, if once I realize that the archive is an open, it's an opening as, an Heide, as, as a very Heideggerian open, I could do whatever I wanted with it. I could pilfer someone else's archive and then put it into mine, right? I could do like Jasper John says, I could steal, which I do in a metaphorical sense. You know, all that stuff really opened me up to the possibilities of what collection could mean and what collection means to history. You know, I think I think what what we tend to do, you know, we were we were talking about this during the, the run last last Friday. What I think we tend to do as people is we, you know, it's just that old kind of 20th century philosophical critique of we accept what people tell us, which means we accept the archives that are given as opposed to finding things that the archive is not, does not, does not want us to know. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like that's what my task is, is to find the stuff the archive doesn't want us to remember and bring that to the forefront and then recontextualize it with weird positionings. Right. So if I'm looking at this image here, uh, the gallery view, which I think we're screen sharing, right? Yes. Like, on the left, that. right. On the left side is the uh, the four tapestries, the quadrant, mm-hmm. uh, hands up, right? And we take, you know, I just took the the sign of the hand or the raised black hand, found it in tra- or in multiple historical instances, and then put it together, and, and that informs the archive, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, so on the top right, we have the Dogon sculpture, was at, which is at the Met. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the right, the right to that is a Glenn Ligon, which he appropriated. So I appropriated from the appropriator. What does that mean? That's performative. It's like <laughs> a reappropriation. Man, that's Derrida. Beneath that is Martin Luther King. And to the left of him is a handcuffed figure with the hands rotated up. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so in this way, the hand uh, allows me or the contextualizing of the hand in this way allows me to open up what it means, whether it's a spiritual raising or a, re- a form of resistance. That's all in there, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, this was one of the pieces that really struck me. I have a history. Um, well, I have a background in art history and I, I taught for many years before coming to the CAC. And, you know, when you look at that gesture through art history and even prior to modern times, you know, there's there's such a connotation with um, either benevolence, um, such as a ruler kind of granting a, a gesture of clemency or oh. a, fear, a fear not gesture, you know, from a religious figure like Jesus or Buddha. Yeah. Right. Um, oh. and, and then these, you know, just from my upbringing, the raised hands in, in prayer, you know, but the connotation that we often have, and I think what you're leading us to um, is how it has been twisted into a form of subservience, um, of submission, um, and and in a totally different way of fear not than it was originally intended as. Right, Um, yeah, 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 you're right. But it seems to me that in the instance of its initial, its initial ordering by which I mean as it, as it represents itself to the warrior cop. Um, that is a surrender, I guess. But I, I, I experienced this kind of quadrant as a resistance against that surrender, mm-hmm. right? Like for me, the oldest image in this quadrant is the Dogon sculpture, which is from like 18th century, 19th century, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that, that for me is, I mean, quite frankly, that is, that is the counter narrative that is required to write the ship that we're, we're in, right? Because what, what, what European archives tell us is that the Dogon sculpture, while it's in the Met, is not made available to black children in school, right? So, so you don't see that paradigm of spiritual success. You don't mm-hmm. see that paradigm of aesthetic uh, uh, assertiveness, right? And what I'm trying to do is bring that historical moment back but bring it within a, a historical context that is trans-historical, or a, a, as Derrida might ca- call it, untimely, 
I'm trying to oh, step out all the time, man, so I can control it. Oh, that's mad. <laughs> no, I, I enjoy that about your work because I feel like it's really only recently that on mass, especially, you know, me as a white person and my, you know, um, you know, peers and in, in, in our race, I guess, is a way to put it, you know, have really accepted um, the fact that the history we've been given is is an incomplete and um, extremely biased one. Yeah. And, you know, there's an exhibition, for instance, right now at the CAC by Tanya Condiani. And I was just speaking yesterday that uh, she brings to light these stories from American history that I certainly didn't learn in my you know, American history textbooks going through high school. And right. I doubt right. seriously that those stories are still being told. Right, um, but, right. Whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa. That, that's important. Let's, let's think about that. So when black peoples have to go to white institutions and learn white knowledge, we then go home and learn our own knowledge too. We are doing double time the work. They used to say, and I'm sure they still say it in families. They said at the dinner table, I grew up. You better go out and, do, and work 10 times harder than your white classmates. Because there was no rest. You go into the world and learn the white way. Then you come home and learn another way. So my, my critique of that, that position is that I'm going to need white folks to do more work now. You know, I'm just being honest. I love I love my yeah. brother, my white brothers and sisters, but I need you all to do more work. And that work does not require, you know, always going out and protesting and smashing stuff, which I think is sometimes terrible. I think it requires research, reading finding modes of empathy with peoples of color. It's hard. It's hard work, y'all. I'm gonna be honest. A lot of you all may not want to do it, but when, if, for those who do, it, it is a rewarding amount of work. It, it, the reward is worth it. Mm -hmm. To be able to understand what it is, the possibilities of what it is to be a person of color. Yeah, that's important. I, I completely agree with you. I, I want to you kind of spurred this uh, story um, that I wanted to kind of bring up, um, particularly around this work, uh, Delay Tung. And um, first, I'm actually going to go back because I, I just want to tell you this space, the very first slide in the presentation that you created using um, the rugs that you created and this arrangement of the, the Zaha Hadid benches created a classroom space. Um, for many of the tours that we had. And I know I had a lot of really rich conversations here and we'll talk about some of those, but the docents did as well. And one of, you know, to your point, exactly. Um, when we were doing the training on this show, um, this particular image was taken from your art, you know, you pulled it from your archive and it was, it's an image of the police raiding a Black Panther office um, in Philadelphia. I think it was 1970. Mm -hmm. um, and what they've done is they, they went in and of course made all of the members of the Black Panther Party inside the office come out, stripped down their clothing, um, and it really a form of humiliation, uh, a form of power. And you see this image and, you know, we can talk a little bit more about it later, but this is one of those instances where you know, the docents, I, um, the, the museum, we really had to grow in our knowledge um, of who the, what the Black, Ban Black Panther Party really stood for. Yeah. And, you know, she, she said, she's like, I will, you know, they're, they're militants. And, you know, I, I had to step up at that point and we had to give information, you know, about you know, what the Black Panther Party was really doing um, in Oakland in the beginning, you know, protecting the streets, protecting people from violent police officers, um, but also, you know, putting in feeding, you know, food programs and education programs, bringing that where it wasn't available to the city. Right. And, right. you know, after that, there was just this revelation, you know, among um, this particular docent who had had said it as well as several others who just honestly didn't know that information. And oh, huh. it it's that kind of knowledge that that needs to get found again, so that we're not walking around with these types of um, you know misinformation in our head. right, right, right. It's it, you know, 
And, but that that requires for people one to do research uh, and and embed themselves in that practice of research. And that doesn't mean you have to go to the library. I mean, but it means you you open yourself to the possibilities of the world. And you're always observing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, let's be honest. They're not going. They're not going to teach the killing of Fred Hampton in elementary school. No. But but that doesn't mean that when children come home, their parents can't teach them that as well, right? right. Um, I mean, cause, I mean, in terms of this image, it's it's necessary for me and for the audience to understand that one, you can actually access this image at uh, Temple University mm-hmm. uh, in their archives, but also that there's um, there's something happening in this image that actually happened to um, to the gentleman who. Uh, to the gentleman who was murdered in Wisconsin. They put seven to eight bullets in that man's back, right? Mm-hmm. That's, what do, that's what they do to, because uh, I, I love doing this with my students. That's what they do in Halloween, the movie, to Michael Myers, because he's supernatural. He is a superhuman. Like in the last Halloween, which is a terrible movie, but I had to go see it. Uh, they lock this man in a basement, fill his body with bullets, and set the house on fire. No doubt he's going to come back. A white man that wouldn't die, throw a knife at him and kill him. The same acts of extreme aggression happen in this image. You have to humiliate these people by taking their clothes away. But also, I'm assuming that there are more than these two cops there with, bunch of, with a lot of guns. Right? Right? The same kind of extreme... Uh, aggression towards or extreme anti-black aggression occurs when in the 1800s or between 1865 and 1965 when black people were being lynched. They didn't just hang the body. They hung the body and filled the body with bullets. He was dead. They would bring him or her down and then fill the body with bullets more. That to me speaks about the surplus and the gifts and the boon that is black people. Corner West is right. We have so many gifts. It's unbelievable. But that's what I want at least peoples of color to realize when they see these works. It's not a negative to me that this image is there. What this image actually tells me if I read it through that lens of the gifts of black people is that we are so powerful that this is how they have to order us. You dig? Hmm. Right. And and it's interesting because because this image itself, can we can we talk about the materiality and what's happening in the image? Yeah. Yeah, right. Because I mean, I mean, I've been I've been so upset with with I've been so upset with the Jacob Blake killings, but I can't be surprised anymore. Right? Black people are not surprised. We're disappointed. We're not surprised with this image. What do we have? We have like a Goya. What's that? The second of May or the um, the third of May? Yeah, the second. Of May. Third, yeah. Right. It's one of those. I'm always bad with the numbers. On the right, we have a line of uh, of beautiful black people. In the middle, we have a black cop. And on the far left is a white cop. What's funny about this image to me is when we have an agency with the figure on the far right staring out at us, engaged in the audience, right? And because this thing is life size, it really, it's the scale makes you feel like you're at the event. That's the point. Mm-hmm. In the middle, we have a black cop with a big black shotgun, I mean, that, the, the, which slithers like a snake. The, the sexual innuendos are obvious to me. And then, but then to the, and you would, you would think he's the one in power, but frankly, he's the smaller of the, the, the two cops. The one on the far left is the white cop with the smaller gun. Mm. But he has more power because he seems to be controlling the whole scene. So for me, I'm really interested in like looking at these images and start dissecting the power structures that you see within, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's important that it's weaving. You know, I really think it's important that it's weaving because one of the questions that you and I were talking about the other day is, well, how the hell did you get to weaving in the first place? <laughs> how the hell is a black kid from Louisville, Kentucky, who never had an inkling, a, a thought in his mind that he would ever be in New York City, let alone run a, 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 an area at NYU? I never thought this was possible. How does this kid get involved in this? Simple. I went to the Met. Hmm. So back in like, what is it, 2010, 2011, 
when I was working with my friend, God rest his soul, Jack Tilton, he would say, you know, you got to go to the mat. And I'd be like, Jack, what the fuck? I go to the mat all the time. Who cares? He said, but you got to go on Fridays. And I would go on Fridays. Why? To go look at famous artists. But I would go stare at like a Richard Tuttle stare at a rock or something. And then I realized, well, why would I stare at like him staring at this thing? He already figured that out. Let me go find something that nobody wants, like the margins, like black people. I found something to me that felt marginal, which was the which was basically the great hall in the medieval wing. And they had all those tapestries. And I was the only one in there next to the attendant. And the attendant, and I would sit there and talk about these tapestries. And for me, I realized that what was interesting about these tapestries is that it felt like the advent of uh, the photographic image. Mm -hmm. Right. So you think about um, jacquard, which is what these are jacquard weavings. If you think about jacquard, who, who essentially invents uh, punch card registration for weaving, which is basically binary codes. Uh, and then you think about how Charles Babbage comes years later and picks that up and then invents what we believe is the grandfather of the computer which is screen culture. I'm thinking to myself, well, every time I'm staring at an image on, on screen, I'm staring at a tapestry, mm -hmm. which didn't like, like, like the opening of the archive, that Heideggerian opening, that allowed me to realize that, oh, well then every image I see, every object that I see, everything that I perceive is distorted because it comes from a screen or a binary code that invents it, right? Even if it's just like binary thinking, that's a distortion. So with my, with, my, with my weavers, we figured out how to distort the images so that we weave them in distortion, right? And it's weird because it does some weird stuff to your, to your mind when you see it up in person, you know? It really mm -hmm. messes you up, right? So that's in there. That, all that kind of, it's like 10 years of research of why these tapestries are so important to me. And then once I figured that out, it just, it was no whole bar, man. Just let, let this brother go. I just went, I went, I'm crazy in the studio. It's great, you know? Hmm. I feel like it's also an, another instance of you uncovering a kind of hidden history as well. You know, because, and we, we talked about this the other day too, you know, this type of work was considered women's work and it was very much usurped, you know, once industry came about and men started moving into the industries. Um, and really running a lot of the the machines and then classified more as a craft as opposed to art. Right. You know, right. But, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Ah, fucker, 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 that's good. But if we, ah, the fucker. But if we think about it in terms of non-Eurocentric thinking, it's not women's mm -hmm. work anymore. It's African, not, men, no. African men weave. As a matter of fact, sometimes African men are the ones who are supposed to weave. And the women do the dying. Right. Because th that, that's how that culture functions. Some of these cultures function. I, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I grow quite weary of Western concepts of being. Western ontologies just don't fit my mind, my mind, man. You know, I just wrote this essay for a friend of mine that's going to be published next year for her show where I was trying to get her to understand that her work is not a, her work undercuts the logic of Western organization. And my sense is that there are black forms of organization, which I call black maternal mathematics. There are original forms of black knowledge, which are mathematical, like a Heideggerian mathematics, that frankly, bob and they weave and they negotiate tough spaces. Harriet Jacobs lived in that, that, that uh, uh, attic for years because she knew how to negotiate tough spaces. That's what black people do. We have another mathematics, ma'am. And for me, I don't, I, I look at this not as women's work. I just look at it as a marginal form that aligns itself with my sense of being from the margins. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I'm, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm just really tired of seeing the same kind of paintings. Right. You know, black figurative painting and other kinds of paintings. It's not that, there's not doing it for me right now. So I, I was searching for a new way of seeing the world, you know, like, like Nina Simone says, you know, you, you to live life, to have no fear is to like to, to live life like a child. Children have no fear. And to, and to live like a child is, is a new way of seeing. And I'm, I'm trying to give the world a new way of seeing. You see. Yeah, and I, I think that is one of the really valuable things regarding your, just your role as also a teacher. 
Um, because honestly, the teachers are going to be, I think that movement as we move forward to break us away from that Eurocentric way of thinking, yeah, because that yeah. has been the status quo for such a long time. And that was the way they were taught um, in order to really, I think mainstream a lot of the change that um, we'd like to see and that you're talking about, we kind of need to, to start there, um, to start kind of in that, that, a system of, of how we build our knowledge. Um, yeah, we do. In you, we really do. I think what was what really was great. I was really grateful for the students who did this at NYU. I don't know about four years ago, they revolted. Nobody talks about it because we didn't we didn't have this like make this public. But they revolted. They were like, mm -hmm. we want a more diverse curriculum. What is this? We're not here for any of this. We are tired of learning about dead white men. And I was like, that's fair. That's fair. Because what happens in, in institutions like universities and sometimes with uh, faculty that get tenure is that you get a little complacent because you, you know, life happens and you, it, you work so hard to get tenure and you, then you get tired. And I get it. I get it. But, you know, my sense is you should sit on the sideline, do some more research about what's happening and then come back to the fore, or, you know, the forefront if you want to do the, the, the labor with us. If not, then you should retire so we can get someone else in your position to diversify this institution. That's my opinion, you see. Um, but in terms of teaching, I think what teachers really need to start doing is what I, I feel I try to do with my students. Uh, and I know some people say in the arts this is wrong because they don't believe in it. But I think we need to start teaching the ethics of making. There's a, there's an aesthetics or there's an ethics to it, I think. Right. Which means um, to me that we are charged with making the world. And we should put things in the world that we want to see. And that anything we put in the world, we should be willing to deal with it. I think students need to recognize their own agency as emerging artists and that their their voices their value is in their voice and that they need to start functioning as uh people who want to see change in the world and that does not stop at the institution they need to be learning it at the institution so that they go and then when they go into the world they can enact it you know some coursework is doing it in terms of praxis but you know not everybody's doing it i think some institutions or some coursework is just about let's make pretty things mm -hmm. But pretty things, I'm not sure, are really going to get us to where we need to go anymore. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed, you were really generous when you were when your show was up at the CAC to talk to um, our educators at a, at a workshop and also students. And um, one of the things I really admired in the way that you talk to people and one of the things we try to do at the CAC when we're touring is give people agency um, to to have their opinion, to to have that that power when they're looking at a work of art. Um, because you do open, you know, open with questions and you allow people's responses to breathe into bigger conversations. And I think we need more teachers who have that, just that drive um, to inspire that curiosity and to inspire that challenge, um, yeah. as opposed to just kind of taking it, you know, taking what you're told. Yes, yeah, it's just um, not it's not that's, that's so boring isn't it it's so boring when someone tells you something you say oh okay yeah i guess so that's so boring well what, why don't you want to buck the system let's buck that's fun bucking and mm -hmm. well, that's fun who i get so bored with the same narratives i mean I, I i never understood when i lived in cincinnati why certain people made nice work i was like cincinnati has a grime about it that is amazing mm -hmm. there are some guttural guts about cincinnati that frankly was washed over with over the rhymes uh upsweep which i get yeah. right but i also i also de devote a lot of my time to coming back to all the shows i do at institutions I, I mean i do it a lot like at hunter i i went back and i did the same thing i did like uh i did tr sensitivity training for all of the docents and the security guards at hunter we yeah. said that we talked about specific works and talked about how to talk to 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 onlookers um i just to be honest i just feel like I used to put this on all artists, but I can't do that anymore. I feel like it's my responsibility to do that. I will give as much as I can while I'm here on this earth, however long that'll be. Because when I'm gone, 
I, I really believe I want to be able to say I did what I was supposed to do. I don't want there any any questions that I didn't do enough. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, currently I've been feeling like I'm not doing it enough, but it could also be because COVID is keeping everybody inside, you know? Yes. Right? I, I, I share I share that sentiment though. I feel, I feel that way. But let's go. I love I love because you told me this great story about this 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 piece here, right? Because this piece is what well, we have like the three images in Escapist, mm -hmm. all on uh, erased Ebony Magazine pages that have been glued together yes. to make bigger sheets. Ebony Magazine is also my, one of my first archives, right? I mean, I remember getting that thing religiously every month when I was a boy, and you could see blackness in material in a certain kind of form. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a class thing happening, but we could talk about that another time, right? But what <laughs> you're seeing here in this image are um, the cop mm -hmm. and the person the cop killed, right? So on the far left is um, Michael Brown and the person the cop uh, the cop who killed him. Uh, the far right is Eric Gardner, and in the middle is Sam Debose. Now, the important thing about Sam Debose, right, is he was murdered by a University of Cincinnati, I think, mm -hmm. red cop. Yes. Um, yeah, off campus. So he he was stalked. He was hunted, you see. And he was assassinated in his car when he was reaching for identification. What was beautiful about this work is what you told me. I love this. Do you mind if I tell her real quick? No, go ahead. It's when it, 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 one of the schools came, I think she might have been in seventh grade or seventh grade or something. I don't remember. And a little black girl comes up to the one in the middle of Sam DuBose and she starts to cry. And her teacher comes up and says, well, what's wrong, child? And the child said, is that Sam? And the teacher says, yeah, how'd you know? She said, that's my mommy friend. He's not here anymore. You see how children see? Yeah. Children see because it's infinite. They can see through all the shit. Children know. And that's why that's why I think Nina's right. To live life like a child is the best way to live. Barring responsibility, you know. Mm -hmm. Every time I every time I, I read that email, it touches me because the children are the one who know they're not socialized enough yet to be to turn everything off. You know, and even yeah. if, I'll stop because I, I ramble, right? But even if we no, think about okay. how this relates to the archive, right? The ebony itself is the archive. For me to erase that, because these are all hand erased, which takes a long mm -hmm. time. Right. I am trying to put my reality back into the archive that I grew up with. I'm not just destabilizing or being untimely to white archives. I'm being untimely to black archives, too. Because I need my reality to be visible. You know. You, you made a really, um, I think, profound comment about how the history um, in many ways of the victim and the perpetrator um, at this point become linked. Mm. And we don't focus enough on particularly who the, the victim was before this occurred. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we are starting to see a lot of in the, the memes coming across social media about, you know, the, the double standard um, between how whites and blacks are treated um, even when blacks are the victim in a, in a situation. Um, how do you view these pieces um, four years later um, with unfortunately more of these instances? You know, they, um, like you said earlier, I was incredibly saddened, um, but not surprised about what happened. I, I, I guess I read them the same way I read, uh, or I read, um, or I, I guess I guess I read them the same way I read Rodney King when it happened. Um, oh man, and think to myself, fifteen years down the line, we're still in the same place. Twenty years down the line, we're still in the same place. You know, I actually just read, uh, reread Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham today. Mm -hmm. Because someone very close to me advised me to reread it. Thank you for that, Deluna. Um, and he says something that's very important that everybody should hear and everybody should read. He said, I'm just disappointed now. He was disappointed in white moderates slash liberals. He was disappointed in white church uh, goers and, 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 and people of that ilk. I'm just disappointed. We're not, I'm not even surprised anymore. I'm just disappointed, you know? Um, yeah, I'm just disappointed. Whew. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. My my sense is, frankly, if people don't do their responsibility to vote this man out of the Oval Office, it's going to get worse. And I won't be the only one disappointed. I think you all will be even disappointed, too, because he's going to start coming after you, too, you know. Oh, I know. Right? Um, Ooh, that's tough. That is tough know, to think about. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Um, you know, what... What I think your show did for us as an institution is put us on a trajectory. And you know, honestly, Mm -hmm. difficult subject matter has never been um, a a big thing for the Contemporary Arts Center. I mean, we show contemporary artists, but you know, what I think it allowed us to do is really begin the work um, as you were talking about earlier um, to start start thinking and I and I think identity, you know, this piece I think especially really drives home that that idea um, of how identity is such a political thing. Um, and and I don't think a lot of honestly even just artists think of it that way. We were talking the other day about this quote that you had from your from your artist talk and I, I wanna uh, bring that up. Sure, sure. Um, you said all art is political and you just have to ask what politic your art serves. And so many artists I hear talk about, you know, how they're not political artists, but yet they'll discuss this idea of identity um, as being a part of their work or, you know, what's important to them. And, and sometimes I have that in the back of my head, in, you know, how do you not understand that identity is a political um, theme, you know? Right. It, it just, Right. Yeah. My, my, my sense has always been that maybe the way they define political has has certain parameters uh, with, with, with which I do not prescribe, to be honest. Mm-hmm. The way I understand political or politics is not uh, Democrat versus Republican. Right. It, it's about relations. Mm-hmm. It's about how we organize and order or economize the world through relations. Right. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. about whenever I whenever I engage the world, which means whenever I wake up, I am being a political being because I am in the world and I am relational to this world. And it's the same thing I was saying about teaching a certain kind of ethics through art for students, that anything I do in this world is going to affect this world, whether whether people see it or not. It still affects the world because we're all a part of this grand ecosystem. And because of that, everything is political. Mm hmm. It just depends on how you define it. If people want to define it in a bi- in binary terms, that's fine. But like I said with the archive, it's not going to open them up to the possibilities of the inevitability of the affirmation of life. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do life affirming things. And if you close things off with binaries, that's just nothing but killing them. Dare to told us that. Yeah. You know, um, but I also think. What, what's required now? I mean, I really appreciate those words you said about me and this show possibly initiating the drive to 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 consider other to consider diverse issues. I appreciate that because I hope that's what my work can do for a lot of people. The more shows I get, right? Um, but now that, that that's just the beginning. That's like that's like step forty of a four, that's like step one of a forty step process, man. That's just yeah. like the recognition. Now now the real work begins, and that's. I'm gonna tell you right, like I said before, it's hard. Listen, listen, it's hard work. And you're gonna get down sometimes and you're not gonna wanna do it. But that's why you have to have a collective of people around you to pick you up called family, whether they're blood or not, you know? And I have family. I have a small close team of family members who help me when I'm down. And I think the institution is slowly becoming a part of that family, you dig? Yeah, well, I I hope we are. Um, I mean, I, I agree. It, it is hard work. Um, I was having a conversation with someone the other day about um, just the the acknowledgement that, you know, you may not actively be doing racist things, but, you know, I grew up in a racist system and I know I've done something racist in my lifetime and, and make assumptions all the time. It's just, it's implicit bias. It's in what we do every day. And it isn't until you make that hard step of acknowledging that that you can even begin to see where you can go. Don't you? Um, 
And it's and it's a difficult thing, I think, for a lot of people who consider themselves, I'm putting on my air quotes, good people, right? Right. right. Um, um, it, it's hard for them to do, but it's what's required. It's that deep dive into who you are and the things that you've done every day of your life and the things you've said and the relationships, as you said, that you have with people that really matters. Right. Um, but I, my sense is that also requires on a very... Oh, I love the fact that Harlem is blasting music right now. So great. I love living <laughs> Harlem. Is the, Oh, my God, I love Harlem. Shout out to my girl, Mo. Um, my sense is that what also is required is an understanding of what a microaggression is, mm -hmm. which also, I mean, it comes from my liberal friends. It comes from my colleagues at NYU. There are times, and I'll say this, and that's okay. There are times I sit in faculty meetings, and I'm like, well, all these are microaggressions, and I, I, I'm feeling and experiencing the racism in this room from people I enjoy, from people who call themselves liberals, but they haven't done the legwork to realize that what they're saying in these meetings is racist. Mm -hmm. And, that goes, and that, that goes from my colleagues in the art program, too. There are times when I sit in meetings, I'm like, they haven't done the legwork to realize what they're saying right now is offensive as hell. Okay, and mm -hmm. and and that is a part of that's like maybe step seventeen. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that'll be my next show. I should just do a, a show that's about the steps that it takes for white people to recognize the legwork it's going to take to right this ship. Because black folks done done the work. I'm gonna need some other people to do the work too, you know. But I like doing mm -hmm. the work. So I'm not gonna stop. Oh, let's talk about this one. I love this one. This Can is we? a. Yes, yes. I I also really, well, I like all of your work, but this one um, created um, some really, I think, meaningful and honestly, um, healing conversations really? for some people. Yes. Um, oh. uh, at least in one experience I had with a group from, um, and I won't say what school, but it was an all girls school here in Cincinnati. That's fair. And, and we were able to talk about um, sexual assault in a really open way um, that um, I could see. I mean, it brought tears to a few people's eyes and, um, you know, they, they were thanking um, everyone at the end for the ability to be vulnerable um, about it. But I think that, you know, we were talking about power earlier and an identity and how identity has levels of power. Um, and I yeah. mean, we have this um, situation, you know, with um, your juxtaposition, which is super powerful, of Brock Turner, um, you know, the white Stanford student who received six months in jail, only serving three. No, you gotta call him what he is. He's the Stanford rapist. He, yes. earned, he earned that title and I will never take it away from him. Bestowed yeah. upon him. Um, and, and then you, the left, I'm sorry. And then the yeah. left, we have mm -hmm. uh, a scene from the film uh, Roots, which I grew up with, uh, which is another one of my archives, which paired mm -hmm. uh, with the video we had in the uh, production as well. Uh, and this yeah. is the scene where Chicken George uh, comes into being. This is his. This is his origin moment. This is when he realized he was black, even though he wasn't on the earth yet. This is mm -hmm. the rape scene when his mother, uh, 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 Kizzy, Kizzy yeah. his daughter, gets raped by the master John Moore. Mm -hmm. Right, and this comes from my realization that at that when I was looking at black archives, I was like, but. Black archives just don't have black images. There are other things that are, and this is the relation out, the relation that we were talking about, right? The, that makes everything political. There are other things that are in relation to blackness um, that may not have black peoples in them, but they, they, in some way, they have a connection to it. And this white child, I'll call him a boy, Brock Turner, um, displayed his entitled white masculinity, his patriarchal mindset his patriarchal psyche in his robbing or row this mm -hmm. woman of her sanctity. And that entitlement that is white masculinity is the, is the very kind of form that cloaks everything else. So it just seems to me that that white entitlement has everything to do with womanhood, womanness and blackness too. It just, it just feels that way, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and to go deeper, when, he, when it was pretty obvious that he had done it, there were certain media outlets that didn't criminalize him. 
But if we look at how Blake is being criminalized by the media, mm -hmm. uh, he was running for this knife, right? They spent, they've spent days trying to drag this, this man, this poor man's face through mud, right? That's also a part of it, right? I mean, the entitlement of this white man to think he could take something that's not his. Oh, wait a minute, that's what they all do. Just being honest. You know, and I and I think it was necessary for me to do this show there because one, his student, or I'm sorry, I'm not gonna say it because that sounds bad. Uh, the reality is he, he he's from Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and this is that come to Jesus moment. Cincinnati's not out of the fray. Cincinnati needs oh. to recognize their responsibility. Mark Twain, you know, has a shadow, casts a shadow over over Cincinnati, saying, you know, y'all are 15, 20, 20 years behind. When the apocalypse comes, go to Cincinnati. You get 15, 20 more years. I'm gonna need Cincinnati to step up. You see. Let's be current. Mm -hmm. so putting a couple of uh, acute shops like this is this is baby Brooklyn on over the Rhine. Don't is not changing the, the fucked up condition we find ourselves in. Right. When they start burying. Um, uh, uh, what do you call them? light poles or uh, uh, cables and over the Rhine, it was already it was evitable that the black people who lived there were about to be evicted. Hmm. Right. There are just ways in which th this this gentleman, uh, this man or this boy is a, is a metonym for all the things that seem to be problematic with where we are now. I just I, to be honest, I will I will say to Stephen and the CAC, I really appreciate and, and commend you all for the, the guts it takes to make that work visible. Because mm. I can make it and put it in my storage. You know, the fact that you all allowed this thing to go, I, I don't want to touch me. I, if we could have more institutions take take efforts like that and have the guts, we gonna be somewhere. Ooh, Harlem get lit. Yeah. Oh, I love the noise in the background. <laughs> yeah, I live next to Ebenezer Church, man. They down right. here probably doing a funeral and they got the motorbikes out here. I love Harlem. Oh, I love it. I was just, I was in New York, um, actually for the first time last November and I loved it. Um, I, I really honestly wasn't sure what to expect. I think I had a, a movie, you know, understanding yeah. of what New York was. Yeah. And I just, oh man, I'd, I'd move there in a second. I loved it. Um, just the life, you know, I always heard how rude New Yorkers were. And I was like, everyone I talked to was nice and friendly. And yeah, I, I really, really liked it. Um, but kind of getting back to the piece, one of the things, um, in addition to what you're saying, um, I was really struck by is this idea of a name and the young woman who, who was raped, um, you know, she put out the statement um, at his arraignment where she, she spoke to this idea of losing her identity and losing her name because she was called Emily Doe or the unconscious intoxicated woman. Mm -hmm. And, um, she, she recently published a book called Know My Name. Um, and, her, and, and her name is Chanel Miller. So I will, I will speak her name. Thank you. Um, but it, it also, it, it made me think about, you know, slavery. And one of the first things they did to people um, that was aggression, but not a physical one, is take their name. Yeah. You know, take the name they were born with and given and replace it with something else. Yeah. And and just that, you know, the 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 parallels between that I think are also a really poignant aspect to this work. Um, yeah, renaming something is, is is such a symbolic act. Renaming yeah. something or someone in this instance when you are a slave, you are a thing. You're an object that can be moved. So renaming something in 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 the parlance of that time, I guess, uh, is a hell of an act. It's mm -hmm. a it's a death. Renaming yeah. someone, someone when they don't want to be renamed is killing them. Mm -hmm. right? May I tell a story? Yes. Uh, when I was a, uh, and let me know if it gets too loud, I can close the windows. Uh, yeah. When I was a professor at the University of Cincinnati, there was a, a trans student, not giving names. Mm -hmm. I, I love this student. She was awesome. She was transitioning from male to female. And uh, I, I called her by the name. She has to be called. Spent a year with her as a student. She was a great student. At the end of the year, she came to me and cried. I said, what the hell you cry for, child? 
She said, because every other professor at this university in the School of Art refused to call me by the name that I, I chose. They consistently, and that's all of those professors that I remember, except for my man, Christopher Holland. All of those professors consistently called her by the name, by her male name. She said, you were the first person here to recognize who I am. I said, I know, that's okay, I get it as much as I can. Hmm. There's power in naming. You know, there's power yes. in naming. And I think with this show, I think that's that's huge for me because the show isn't limited to knowing or finding or locating this, this deferred origin of blackness. It's about trying to locate the deferred origin of identity itself. There are moments when women are consistently reminded that you all are women, right? I I I hear I heard war stories or war stories or horror stories when I first dropped this idea. My my female students at NYU were like, "Oh, I get catcalled all the time." I said, "Really?" They said, "Yes, no." And every time I get catcalled, I am consistently reminded that I am a woman, and in an inferior position. They say, you know, when I try to get on the train, this man uh, spreading or whatever. Dude, don't even let me sit down. Right. I'm constantly getting hit on. And I was and that was eye opening for me. So I need to do more work. Right. Like to, 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 to quote one of or to cite my beloved DeLuna. I'm, I'm now reading Michelle Obama's Becoming, which, uh, you know, shame on me. I did not do so. as I, did. I am learning so much about myself. You're gonna love it. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful book. The sister can write. But I am learning so much about myself through the book. Right. As I would hope some people, uh, people who come to my shows learn so much about themselves through my work, mm -hmm. right? And hopefully they can open themselves up to the possibility that it's not limited to blackness, even though that's huge, that's a huge part of it, but it's about opening yourselves up to what it means to be a person in this world, mm -hmm. you know? And who, who, who or what has informed your very being, your ontology? I'm interested in that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Oh, we've gone so far. Should we open it up? Are there questions? I, I think that's that's a good good segue. Thank you. Sure, 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 sure. I can, I can keep talking. Um, you know, when things are rolling, you just let it happen. Um, so let's kind of move it move it back. Um, I'm gonna put a, a question up here from Jay. How do you organize your research and put it together artistically? Does the research guide the project, or does the artistic idea come first? Oh, uh, well, it all depends on how we define research, but I, I will you think of it in a traditional sense. Um, sometimes a song will drive me. Usually comedy drives me if I'm listening to Richard Pryor or George Carlin or sometimes Lenny Bruce before he went so angry. And sometimes jo uh, Dave Chappelle, those people spur me, you know. Um, sometimes it'll be something I see on the train and then that gets me, gets me moving. But... To be honest, after the first nine or 10 years dealing with tapestries, once I figured that was the form, now that I have the form, now I'm just looking for images and materials that engage, can engage that form in an intricate way. Um, the other thing that helps me is I read, I read, uh, I'd say, I guess, I guess you could say, I, I read uh, German and French theory, as I've been, I've been like throwing Heidegger and Derrida out there, whatever. But I read those people and, you know, other people like Foucault or Bernard Stiegler or Baudrillard. I read those people because they do what my man, Christopher Holland, PhD uh, professor at, at the University of Cincinnati at DAP School of Art, we call thinking in constellations. So I don't try to think on one level. I think in conspiratorial terms, and I think in multiple ways at once. And because I do that, I hope that people will come back to the show and see multiple things every time they come back. You know, it's like a good book, you know? I think the other, the one more thing I'll say is I like to read weird uh, nonfiction. So right now I'm reading uh, Alice in Wonderland. And what that's doing for my thinking on temporality is just unbelievable. So that helps. That's fun. Um, I was reminded, we were talking the other day about what you're working on now. So I'd like you to, to, to talk about that, but um, I had a, a student who, a, a previous student, who his name is Derek Bell. I'll give him a shout out. He's a, a, a teaching artist out in Oakland, California now, and um, he was he he has a, a theme that he often uses um, in his art with the king, and he specifically um, 
created a post about Chadwick Boswell and Bozeman, and I and I've been seeing a lot of the references to the idea of, of King um, with him recently. So, um, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, let's go there. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go down the line. So yeah, right now, let's see. I just opened a show upstate at the amazing gallery run by owned and run by my dear friend Jane. Uh, it's called Ice House Gallery. Uh, beautiful space. Uh, I have some of the uh, these paperworks that I worked at uh, Dudonne. Mm -hmm. um, the Martin Luther King hand is was turned into a sheet of paper, which is a whole nother animal. Uh, so that that kind of notion of the King starts is there. But then, uh, you know, uh, I'm doing a show at the Telfer Museum of Art in Savannah next year. And the name of the show is Heavy as the Crown. And it starts with the same kind of question or premise, uh, which was essentially the, the, the developing of a spectrum or a bracketing of time. Uh, which bases itself on language. So I looked at the term king, which, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a royal thing happening there, but thought about how king relates to black peoples and thought, oh, Martin Luther King Jr. Well, let's find a king that occurs after him, Rodney King. So I develop a spectrum between two kings and I find a bunch of images or material that functions within that to really consider how um, black power possibly has dwindled or depreciated or declined um, in, a, in a certain kind of way uh, within that spectrum. How do you go from royalty of, of King Jr. to a cop, like I was saying before about the, the superhuman strength mm -hmm. of black peoples to a cop or a series of cops reinitiating Rodney King into his blackness by beating him, you know? So the work that I'm doing for the Telfer show is all about that. We have a couple of new uh tapestries coming from that and between then between between the show we opened oh yesterday and the telfair show i got other stuff happening too right i've got uh i'm doing a lecture at the tyler school of art i think the 23rd of, of september where i'm gonna go in so i'm doing a lecture at six o'clock in the evening but i'm doing a, one of my mm -hmm. theory workshops for their grad students which i think i might do for other people in the future i don't know i have to see if people hit me up on ig and be like yeah let's do a theory workshop no we want you to you know, Will that be recorded by chance? So I, it depends on, I, maybe if, if people really want to do it, because I can go in on some theory. I think for Tyler, I'm, we're going to be doing Heidegger and trying to figure out how we can apply Heidegger to a, a weaving and printmaking. Hmm. Um, yeah, but there's, there's a lot of stuff I'm working through uh, that I hope uh, that I hope will 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 write will write the ship. Or at least, or at least, put a drop in the bucket. So in the future, which I, which I am inherit, we are all inherited too. Somebody will pick it up later and then continue, continue it on. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's all we can do. We can do the best we can in our generation, and we had that conversation the other day. Hopefully, we can write it for the next. Right. Or at least make it know. better. Well, this. Oh my goodness, there's just so much work to be done. And then there are moments when you can get overwhelmed, but if you just realize that, that you can only do as much as you can, you do, the, like my father would say, you do the best you can with what you have. And I can mm -hmm. only do as much as I can while I'm here. I'm not, you know, I think that, 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 that's, the, that's the winning app. That wins me back, that if we can all do the best we can with what we have, especially in COVID now, right? When you're trying to mm -hmm. teach students, how do you make art in your apartment? Well, go right. give me a packet of ketchup and the, the newspaper. Let's make some prints with ketchup and newspaper, you know? Let's yeah. let's keep it cute and keep it moving. Let's go. Experimental printing methods. <laughs> Give me a potato and let me carve it. Yep. <laughs> the motorcycles are out. Yes, black bikers. Mm, mm, mm. Must be a nice day in New York. Oh, do we have any more questions? I know I'm running. Um, I'm we have one, and maybe it can kind of take us out because um, I, I want I can tie it into. The question I have for you about Trump being an influence. Oh, yeah, um, an yeah. You, you had mentioned in the six questions you did for um, the exhibition back in 2017 that Trump was an influence. And I was wondering if he if he still is or if it's moved bigger. Um, and Peggy's question was about um, black empowerment voting this November. Oh, well, you know, uh not just black folks, but black folks, you need to get up and vote. I like, I, to be honest, I love that they're, they're, I don't know if they're doing it outside of New York, but they're running these, 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 uh, this footage or no, these ads, um, 
starring Cardi B. I love it. And Cardi B's like, you need to do the census with them large nails. I'm, I'm like, go ahead, girl. Bring that margin to these people. Um, and she's like, you need to do the census. And, you know, she's right. And I love the fact that th that 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 the Democratic Party is at least trying to tap these folks, you know, to get a, to get black people and young people uh, energized to go vote. Right. Because I think the political sphere has for so long marginalized certain voices to think that those voices have no cultural capital. But let's be honest. Black people create American culture, period. We have created damn near everything that is hip in America. We have. And we have a cultural value that is in a surplus. We And that is one of the gifts that we give. And we do ourselves an injustice if we don't, if we don't support that gift by voting. Because if we don't vote, they're going to keep this this orange man in the office and he will consistently disregard, downgrade, denigrate and destroy everything that we have given to this um, to this system. I'll, I'll say this. And Doc Rivers is right. We are tired of giving to a country and loving a country that does not love us back. I'm going to be honest. It's going to be real hard this semester to go back into this university and teach white students and deal with white colleagues when I am dealing with the struggles of being black. I am tired. I will say this and we could be finished or done. No, finished. Turkeys are done. People are finished. <laughs> I'm going to need y'all to do more work. Black people need you all to do more work. And, if, and, and, and I'm going to need you to be honest, to be honest, I'm going to need you not to ask me what to read. Do the research. Put the legwork in. It's a hell of a reward. Dig? Dig. Thank you. Uh, I I love and very much appreciate your honesty and your willingness yeah. to, to do this with me today. Um, I know. I'm sorry. No, you're great. I, I think, you know, we, we kind of had that brief conversation the other day about the, the flippantness of how are you. Um, yeah. And, you know, despite how you're feeling, you know, putting the work in today with me and, and talking about this, because I know you you put some knowledge in somebody's head out there and, and made a difference. So thank you so much for your time. Can I say one more thing? One more Absolutely. thing uh, or two more things. If you're if the people are really interested in my ideas, you can always go to uh, the E-Flux Journal and find my essay uh, Echoes from the Hole. Doubling Doubling Darkness is Most Dark. That 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 is my my first uh, published attempt at a, a kind of French German form of writing. Uh, and if you and if anybody ever wants to holler at me, you know, get at me. You could be mad or you could be happy talking to me. Just get at me on IG, man. You know, DM me. I, I, I talk to people sooner or later. It just takes me a while. But, you know, contact me on IG. I'm all I'm interested in ideas. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in continuing this dialogue in any form we can. You know, Great. that would include possibly doing theory, them or theory seminars and all the like. OK, Great. Well, thank you, Noel. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today and, and watching later on. Um, you can join us again in a, in a month. Last, Remember, it's the last Sunday of the month. And our next speaker will be Marilyn Dykeman. She'll be talking with Amara Antila, our senior curator. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.